I started teaching here at UCL in the year 2000, 2001, I was invited to be part of a small delegation uh, from this institute to travel to China. They included our then head of the institute, Peter Ucko. Now at that time, I was, I was interested in the origins of agriculture and was trying to learn what I could about it in all parts of the world, including China. So one of my real highlights of that trip was at one of the dinners, I had the chance to meet uh, Professor uh, Yan Weiming. And so I had a chance to really have a conversation with him and quiz him, ask him lots of questions. And I came away with a, a strong interest in wanting to learn more. There are certain things about the style of archaeology and excavation in China that are quite unique and, and special. And one of those is that I think it's, uh, it's, it's very much rooted in the local. And I think it is important that it is rooted in place. You know, so it's excavations that are aimed to understand how people lived in a particular place in a particular landscape. Uh, the other thing that's important is, is scale. The growth of kind of large scale excavations in China in recent decades has accompanied the, the kind of cutting edge of archaeological science. And so systematic sampling and, and, and scientific approaches has been part of that uh, scaling up of archaeology. One of the things that came out of that developed after that trip was the International Center for Chinese Heritage and Archaeology. The idea behind that center is very much to create a structure so that we can bring, you know, theoretical ideas and developments that might be happening here and uh, expose Chinese colleagues to them, uh, but also to bring those developments, those theories and developments and archaeological information from the Chinese side into our own uh, teaching and research here. And so on the back of that new center, I was able to get some funds from UCL to go to China in November 2004, October, November 2004. And I was able to join for a few weeks the uh, training excavation of Peking University at a site called Baligong in southern Hunan province. I was able to also see the then new excavation at a site called Tenlo Shan in Zhejiang province. And, and it was clear that, you know, the preservation and the, the quantity of plant remains from that site was really extraordinary. And so I then went back to that site a couple of times in 2006 uh, and in 2007. It became um, clear that we were not just looking at early rice agriculture, but we were looking at rice as it was evolving from the wild form of rice to what we think of as domesticated rice today. Ultimately, we published some of those data in the journal Science. The origins of agriculture and the domestication of crops is a subject that can appeal to a very wide audience. Everybody eats, and almost everybody in the world eats crops that have been grown through agriculture. The crops that were domesticated in different places were different, uh, and the resulting combinations of foods and foodstuffs and, and the way cooking developed around them was different in different parts of the world. So. Uh, we see right from the beginning of, the, of agriculture, right from the Neolithic uh, in China, a um, elaboration of cooking techniques focused on boiling and steaming. That's quite different from what we see in early agricultural societies in Western Asia. So you can start to think about how these long-term culinary patterns have persisted over the long time. As a professor, of course, a major part of my job is to teach students and to train the next generation of archaeologists. Since 2012, I think, we have had a master's degree called the Archaeology and Heritage of Asia, uh, which I helped to design. It includes Central Asia, China, South Asia, Southeast Asia. Um, and the idea is to encourage the study of archaeology and the comparison of archaeology in those different regions. I've also uh, taught, taught as a guest lecturer at, at, at Beida and at Shandong University and, and Sichuan University uh, and Northwest Universities. A lot of archaeobotanical research has focused on in, in, essentially in central China, but we still know much less about green vegetables and leafy crops or tuber crops. This will be very important for filling out that story of both culinary uh, diversity within central China, but also may be very important for some regions like southern China. One of the regions of China that I'm most interested in pursuing further research in, and I'm very fascinated by, is in the southwest. So this is Yunnan province, and maybe some of the adjacent uh, provinces. Ecologically, in terms of the biogeography of the species there, it's, a, it's, a, it's one of the most diverse floras in the world, regionally, because you have the juncture of vegetative crops like uh, 
tubers like yams and taro. You have, of course, the cereal crops, rice and millet that are coming out of China, but you also have crops that have come from India. I think there's a lot of fascinating interaction and cultural diversity in that region. Traditional systems of land use can be very important in uh, conserving landscape and biodiversity. So if someone is interested in archaeobotany, you know, where does one start? So I would say first get trained in some archaeology, get some excavation experience. Then you need to start to learn something about plants. But uh, the truth is botany is all around us. It's in our kitchens and it's in our grocery stores. Uh, but, the, but don't just say, oh, well, that's a tomato. I'm going to eat it. Think about where does the tomato come from? How is it structured? How would you recognize it archaeologically? Start thinking about each of those plant foods that you eat as a kind of a research project in itself.